Welcome to Here is Where We Meet, an original podcast series produced by Tank. I'm Michael Morris. And I'm James Lingwood, and you're listening to Here is Where We Meet, a series of conversations with just a few of the artists we worked with across three decades as co-directors of Art Angel producing extraordinary art in particular places across London, the UK and beyond. We're pleased to be joined today by Ronnie Horn from her studio in New York City. Ronnie's installation, Vatnasafen, Library of Water, opened in 2007 and was the first project Art Angel produced outside of the UK. Situated in a former library in the town of Stikisolma on the southwest coast of Iceland, the Library of Water houses 24 glass columns of glacial water and weather reports from people on the island to create an experience of ever-changing weather conditions inside and out. Actually, I just was trying to remember on the way here how you and James first met. And I think it was in the 90s, but I'm not sure of the circumstances. Oh, remember I remember how James and I met. He came down to visit me in my studio above the McDonald's on uh, Third, was it Third Street? Yeah. And we had never met. I knew you were Art Angel and you knew I was making this series of books called Two Place. I think James wanted to meet you. You wanted to meet me, but it was not for any reason. It was just to get get a face with a name or something. The first, I'm pretty sure the first time I met James was in that studio. Yeah. That, that, which that. I left in, uh, two, I left around 1999, 2000. So, I mean, I first felt that I had met Ronnie through her books. Yeah, yep. Um, and as those books, you know, it was a series of, of artist books, still ongoing, I think, which were all based on, mainly based on photographs of Iceland. I think one or maybe two on on drawings made in Iceland. So that was actually my introduction to Ronnie, which was through the work. And then secondly, through actually meeting Ronnie in person, first in New York and then in London, when you had made, at that point, this body, this work called Some Thames. And, you know, so you'd made the work actually through another commissioning agency in London called the Public Art Development Trust. And obviously, on one level, I was quite envious because it's such a beautiful work. (laughs) And it was about London. And it was made by, you know, a colleague in the field. You were frustrated because you'd made the work. And you were looking for a way of presenting it in London. We then said, well, we couldn't really get involved in presenting a work. That's right. I remember that. By another organisation. But it sort of began a conversation about, well, what could we possibly get involved in together? The original uh, commission really was conceived as a book called Another Water. And it was more loosely about water. And then when I wound up on the Thames looking at it, I was so taken with its hypnotic power and how it was drawing me out of myself. And there was this very subtle sort of not threat, but darkness that came with it, you know. And I and that's when I started to, to research why I research it with the um the police in that area, and also just liter- literarily, what the, what the history was, from you know Joseph Conrad's descriptions to Dickinson and so on. So, uh, oh, excuse me, to Dickens. I'm so stuck on Dickinson. <laughs> to, uh, Charles Dickens wrote ref- referenced the Thames quite quite a number of times, and, and of course, uh, there is a, a really profound history associated with cultural history associated with the Thames. It's mostly, from my point of view, associated with death, usually suicide. So that that became a kind of one of the, you know, a foothold in that body of work. I think Conrad's first voyage to the Congo left left on the Thames before he, way before he wrote Heart of Darkness, when he captained uh, the Wadé Belge. He has beautiful descriptions of the Thames, though. 
very yeah. dark but beautiful you know i mean they really nailed the whole thing down i remember uh, james very clearly wanting to make a, a, a work with you um but it, it wasn't clear what that was going to be and you actually challenged us to, for the first time not to do something in london you want well, to i never gave myself credit for that i thought james was like you guys had decided you want to go international that's that's true. And I remember with James, like he wanted to come to Iceland with me. And I was like, no, I don't want to give up my solitude. No, I'm not going to betray myself just to do a piece with you. That was what was going on in my head. I don't know if I ever told you that. Anyway, you, you came and we had a brilliant time together. And I'd never shared Iceland. I'd never traveled specifically uh, over, over, I don't know, what was it, a week or something or Less. Yes, it's about a week. You you met me in the arrivals lounge at Keflavik Airport. <laughs> mm -hmm. and then, wow, uh, I did and that, then, huh? Right, no, I was aware that you were resistant, that you hadn't shared Iceland with many people in the art world. I mean, I knew that it was, and you'd, you'd, you'd already written very eloquently about it being your kind of open air studio. So mm, mm, mm. You, don't, you know, yeah, yeah. You, you, but you, you, you we had such a good time, and I thought. You know, and also because I love Art Angel, I loved Art Angel. I thought it was a brilliant institution. Put the artists first, you know, and the conceptual potential of art uh, first, and then and then the whole the culture at large was always secondary. It's like the opposite of a museum or or an art gallery. But I had no idea what I wanted to do. Had you been to Stickisholmer? Had you had you been to had you been to the village of Stickisholmer? before that? Well, I'd been to the village in 1978. Um, Tell us the story of, uh, of, of your relationship with the building when you first saw it, what you felt about it, why it spoke to you. The thing that I really took away, Sikisong was a beautiful little town on this bay, beautiful, beautiful bay, large bay that goes out to the Atlantic Ocean. And weather is quite extraordinary there. Uh, year round, um, just in its the light and the the qualities of life it brings to the community is really stunning. I thought that building, first of all, it was at the high point of the town, which I thought, you know, okay, that that's definitely prime real estate. And when I found out what it was, I was really taken by the town. It was a library. They put the library at the high point of the town. And anybody with money would have killed to have that property because of the views. And I just loved that. That endeared me to Sticky Somer. Little did I know, it wasn't what it appeared to be. That must have been a mistake or something. <laughs> so, uh, because they turned out to be quite con quite conservative about a very provincial, let's say that, you know. But that was my first connection with it, you know. Then you add in the the visual qualities, which kind of like it looks like a deco period gas station, you know. I thought, oh, that you know that was nice too. So the whole thing was, you know, like a package for me. It was just, I could just easily imagine doing a work or would try to do a work that would take on that view and everything uh, around it. But, you know, importantly, it was, there was this idea of it being, I think we call it a long-term installation. But it was a different kind of approach to a work for you. I mean, are you, you know, you mainly made exhibitions or, or books or projects, and here you were making a place, right? You know, I had done a couple of installations, long-term or permanent, whatever you call them, but not as ground up as this and not sort of not spontaneous generation, but almost like coming out of the place. So very much the the the, the concept that, that I developed was inspired by my being there and my relationship to Iceland and knowing Iceland the way I did. There's no question. So it was definitely, as you say, it was quite unique in in uh, in my range. And it really appealed to me because conceptually, I liked the way this building could become a part of the community, even though it wasn't 
public art because I uh, I bowed out of any uh, interest in public art a long, long time ago because there's just too much compromise involved. But since the public itself wasn't it basically wasn't really structurally involved or financially involved, I, c- I could do exactly what I wanted without compromise. We never really used the phrase public art to describe anything we did, really. When, when I first saw the building, I immediately felt it should be a lighthouse. And then I realized it was a lighthouse. It was a, it was a place where light was refracted. You know, it, it, gas station, lighthouse, library. I mean, it was all of those things. The project was, was, a, a, was the sum of various parts. It, it was not only uh, an exhibition, an installation. Uh, it was, there was also weather reports. There was a writer's residence. I mean, in what sequence did those those elements um, come to be, those, those parts to it? I was thinking of it as a kind of communal gathering place, so I wanted it to have a certain flexibility. I, I wanted to have its own t- integrity, but I wanted uh, people to enjoy the place, to be there and, you know, enjoy the views and enjoy whatever. And that, in other words, I didn't want to take the space away from the town. I wanted to make it more active. So from that point of view, obviously the Library of Water was the core of it. And I think that the Weather Reports You, which was extremely important to me as a kind of collective self-portrait or, or, or yeah, self-portrait, it felt like it could have been the start of something more ambitious. And how did the community um, first uh, respond to what you wanted to do? And did that change over time? And can you talk a little bit about how you brought the community with you? Well, I think James has a much clearer idea of that because James is really interfacing heavily. But for my part, he did bring me in to give a, a presentation of my work so people could get to know me so that it wasn't... Um, you know, completely unknown. And there were a fair number of people who attended those presentations. Um, But James is working full time to integrate the community with the ambitions of of Library Water. You know, there was a a spectrum of of opinion ranging from probably a minority who were actively enthusiastic, younger people um, who really wanted to you know, saw this as being potentially um, a catalyst for things to change in the community. There was another minority who were hostile, you know, hostile to, you know, however um, diplomatic we tried to be, hostile to a kind of foreign intervention, actually. <laughs> and then in the middle, probably the largest sector was sort of, was sort of something somewhere between curious and indifferent. Mm-hmm. You know, you've always got to account for anything to do with public or community you've got to account for indifference you know that was that was quite a chunk so so it was was actually interested fairly benign the 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 hostile voices we we spoke to and they you know it wasn't there was no campaign they just kind of made their made their views felt and then sort of disappeared away and Ronnie had some ideas about you know in a sense it was really about the community community generating their own uses But there were also people uh, involved in the fishing industry that were actively opposed to bringing in anything new to Sticky Summer because they were sort of putting all their money into turning the the village into a museum, restoring all the old buildings and making it like a museum village. And uh, that was not a benign position. They were quite actively uh, trying to undermine it. Presumably for each member of the community, it rather depends on who they hear it from and in what, what sort of sequence you, you actually have your meetings. Yeah, I mean, there were. There were. We did have advocates in, in both in Iceland and, and in Stickisholma. Well, the uh, first mayor was very supportive. Yeah. But they keep switch, they, mayors kept switching out like every eight months. It was like, what, a new mayor? I, I think the town was really actually, the reality is it's, it was extremely provincial and extremely resistant to any form of change, which I don't think is unusual. But but I didn't I underestimated how um, much inertia there was there. We should also mention some of the pleasures in it, and some of the pleasures was getting to know some really wonderful people in Iceland, and actually some some great people in Stikisoma who did have real enthusiasm. 
And we should say that the library of water is it's still there. You know, it's it's there. It's kind of how would you describe it? It's it's a latent thing until people go in in the summer. Then it you know it's it's open. Should be open year round, but I mean, let's let's focus a little bit on on one of the elements we haven't talked about so far, which is the water. So we talked about the you know the collections. There are a collection of of um, words, a collection of 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 statements um, from people living in the area. There's a collection of, of, of glacial water. And in a way, the kind of place is sort of barometer, isn't it? But, but not a barometer of weather, so much as a kind of barometer of climate. Because, you know, you had even written at the time when, you know, we opened the project that some of the glaciers from where you'd collected the glacial ice to then create the water in these transparent, in these glass columns, some of those glaciers would not continue to exist in our lifetimes. And it transpired very quickly that there is already one of the 24 glaciers which is extinct or, or not Well, a glacier doesn't go extinct, it just disappears. Right. <laughs> I don't know where this word extinction comes from. So it just uh, it dries up? melts is what it does it melts into nothingness and will that eventually happen with all 24 well i think i think uh Sneifelsjokel, one of the most revered glaciers really the volcano is what's revered because it's the um according to jules verne that's the entrance to the center of the earth right so it really has a, a metaphoric value that's really on its way out too i mean there are a number of glaciers that were collected that are definitely on their way out. And then some which, you know, Vatna uh, Jokel is the, was the largest glacier in uh, continental uh, Europe. And as far as I know, it's gotten a lot smaller, but it's still, you know, it's going to be around certainly as long as I'm alive. So so the, the, the project has, has, has changed in meaning over time as climate has become more extreme. Absolutely. Crisis. Yeah. And uh, I did not conceive of this as an ecological measuring tool, but it became that. And that was fine with me. But what I did was I was looking for a way to limit the sources of water so that I could have some sort of homogeneity in the presentation. So I limited it to glacial water or glacial ice, which is how we took it. I could have taken it as water as well, but something about the idea of taking something from the source had a really profound appeal on me. So that was the, the structure for this collection. So the, the, the collection, um, dominates the space but there's also uh, a, a collection of words on the embedded in the floor perhaps you could describe that yeah basically you're dealing with two sculptures one's the installation uh library one's the installation um uh water collected which is the work with all of the floor to ceiling glass columns that we've been describing the other is something called You Are the Weather, Iceland. And that is a, a series of works that I've developed with these rubber floors, which contain, they have uh, words in, in, inserted into the rubber. Uh, the words are collected around the idea that they apply equally to the weather and to humanity, right? Iceland has a lot of a lot of words. Mar uh, English has has a nice collection of words too. So, obviously, the first ones I did were in English, um, and they included everything from frigid to um, calm. You know, so a really quite quite a a broad range that was specifying a lot a lot about sexual or sensual qualities that are, are shared between weather and the body, human body. So I love that intersection. The weather words can, and they have to some extent, migrated beyond that place. Could you ever imagine the, 
the um, water collected. Oh so- God, no! I I would love to franchise the Library of Water. It was one of my it's one of my dreams, really. It still is. I was just thinking about it recently. I came so close to having a new Library of Water in, of all places, Basel. No Vardis was looking was was. Well, they were seeking a commission, and at the last minute, the thing fell through for reasons way beyond my control. But it would have been a building with a uh, with a collection of water at a pharmaceutical company. I thought that would be, you know, I mean, I I myself am no diplomat, but I thought that's a good look for them. So no, I haven't been able to realize that, but I still, I'm still dreaming. Was that glacial water again? I was probably going to do glacial because it's so important to their culture, and I thought I have to. Uh, you know, acknowledge that, really. Uh, and of course, now it's radically changed since that happened, which was eight years ago. What What other waters are you interested in? Oasis, waters from unique sources uh, like that, and deserts, that would be something. Juve, something called juvenile water, which is water that's never come to the surface of the earth. So it's completely, un, it has never been in contact with the atmosphere. Uh, waterfalls, you, you could, you know, however you want. And every every location has a different range of opportunity there. I, I actually thought Switzerland was important because it's landlocked. So you don't have ocean, you don't have salt water. And but you have the mountains and the, and you have the, the the glaciers. But if I went to Africa, I would be looking at it very very differently, to, or to a tropical area where water has is more um, water is more insidious. You know, it's more in the form of humidity. I don't think there is a location in the world that shouldn't have a library of water. Different different forms uh, or idioms are present different options. And depending on what's on my mind, those that's how I drift. There are things you can do in uh, drawing that you can't do in, in, let's say, sculpture or a sculpture in photography. Or To me, they're all options of equal interest to me. And depending on conceptually where I'm coming from, I'll go there, you know. And in some cases, go there it doesn't mean I have to make the thing with my hands. So it's just a question of finding the right community or person or whatever it is to do it. For me, conceptual aspect is extremely prominent in my work. Uh, and so dr- writing and drawing are probably the two acts that are I most um, I feel closest to in the sense that you know, it's all improvisation to some extent. You're making it up as you go along. Um, you're developing, your idea is actually evolving as you work it. I don't have that, like, there's a lot of work I do, particularly sculpture, and to some extent, although not entirely photography, uh, where I need to know a lot about where I'm going before I get on the ride particularly with sculpture. Because of the production involved in it. Because of production, and it's it's mostly hands-off with me. I don't really produce the work myself, so I have to know what exactly I want, how to communicate it to people and make sure and troubleshoot it. You know, it's more like that. Since I consider my ultimate form as, or in, not photography or sculpture, but in fact experience, Experience, the experience is what I'm trying to work with, what I'm trying to provide somebody with in the end. And all of these idioms are just sort of uh, secondary. Uh, they're important, but they're the, the real uh, thing that I'm working with is the experiential and what kind of experience I'm trying to elicit from, from the, or share with the viewer. Drawings are shorthand, really for a kind of range of activities which involve mark making, writing words, cutting and, and, and splicing. I mean, I'm intrigued about the cutting and splicing thing. So that, like you have a form, then you've got to cut it up and you're reorganizing. You mean, uh, I've had dealers come into my studio and say, Ronnie, why do you have to cut these up? They look, I'd like to, I'd like to sell them this way. And I'm like, well, you know, I, I, I love the idea of taking it apart and and recomposing it 
or composing it. It never was composed, so now I'm going to compose it. And that act of composing, it's improvisation. It's a very beautiful dialogue that you have in the studio. I have, I'm somebody who's loves to be alone and I have the reason I like to be alone is I have a lot of interior space somehow psychologically and I I can go places you know and that's really important to me and drawing and and writing are both have activity are both activities that suit that life of the mind and the and the body but the thing with uh drawing uh with with writing is I I see it as a as a form of of drawing really you know, I think there are a lot of similarities between the two. And you get to arrive at, you know, really what amounts to a discovery. It may not be Thomas Edison, but it, 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 it's a discovery that allows an insight into something beyond it. That, that explains also your love of Emily Dickinson, because the form and content of the writing is so enmeshed. You can't take yes. one away from the other. It's it's the perfect form for the content that she wants to, the experience that she wants to l tell you about. Yes, I I agree. She's she's absolutely uh, uh, some an artist that I feel, you know, as as you know, really deeply, deeply connected to Clarice Lispector as well, for a long time. But her work is is in translation, so I was a little bit more reluctant to go there until I met Ellen Sixu and she helped me with the translation so that I could perhaps trust in them in another way. Do you still um, go back to Dickinson's, are you still reading Emily Dickinson's poems? Well, I don't think once you've delved into Dickinson, um, you ever not read her. She, she is, she, she's life-changing for me. So she's always in there, in the mix of things. It interests me the fact that she didn't travel at all, and and if it's the sense that she didn't even try or to get out there, you know, she was a very apolitical as far as uh, like uh, I'm not even sure she knew about the Civil War. You know what I mean? It, it some of the things that were going on in her time were not. It was not clear how aware she was of it. So there was a level of isolation there, which I can relate to, but I don't know if I advocate for it, but... But also with a huge internal space. I mean, you know, her mind was her studio. Her studio was her yes. mind in the way that you described. Everything that was around her was something that she was aware of in, you know, physical proximity. And her bedroom, there was a little table there which I'm told she wrote on. Those were, everything in there was an authentic reproduction. That's what they told me. All the originals are in storage at Harvard. <laughs> so the table was like, I don't know, two feet, maybe at the most, maybe it was 18 inches square. I thought, you know, there isn't even enough room for a dictionary here. So she probably had to go out with a big, you know, a dictionary in the hall that she would go out because she loved to love the dictionary. And this little pl little place to write it was so, so intimate and uh, modest. I, I love that. I love the simplicity of it. Well, the poetry is intimate and modest as well. It's, it's, it reflects that. Yeah. I mean, everything in that room was modest. The bed was tiny, but it was spacious. It would have been a word. I could, you know what, when I go to a hotel, I know right away whether I can work in it or not. You know, that's the first judgment I make on the hotel room. And if I'm going to be there for a while and I don't think I can, I leave immediately. <laughs> so, you know, in Iceland, it was ideal because these, when I would stay in what they call the hotel, which was really a, it was a school that they converted for the summer. You, and you would have, you always had your sleeping bag with you because there was nothing else. You, you know, there were no, there's no bedding or anything. Simpler, the better for me. I think that may be why I'm attracted to the North, you know, if, uh, until recently, they you you were pretty restricted in your options there. So I think North is disappearing on us as we speak. So it's, it's you know definitely overshadowing my time on Earth now. Yeah, you mentioned that that uh, obviously Dickinson was content to stay at home and not to travel, and was probably not aware of or not engaged with 
you know, the, the conflicts of the time, you, by, by contrast, you are deeply aware of them. You are deeply engaged. And, you know, what gives you hope at the moment? Unfortunately, anything to do with humanity is problematic at this point for me. Individuals, no. I mean, I think they're, I mean, that's the top of the top. But as a, a cultural phenomenon, I, I have difficulty, a, a phenomenon, I have difficulty with it. The thing that gives me hope is that nature keeps her indifference and to the extent to which she's destroyed, she'll revive in whatever form she it, it happens. So humanity is irrelevant, right? I cannot bear to see the destruction of nature. It's physically, spiritually painful for me. And I have, in the last 10 years or so, withdrawn a lot more radically from humanity or being with people has become more difficult for me. In a, as a social phenomenon, like one-on-one, -on -one, that's just, that's essential to me. But the social expression is so foreign to me, I can't relate to the animal we are. I, I'm really struggling with it. You know, I can't relate to what people want. If I look at Trump and think, OK, now if he's elected, that means that this is what this country is about because they've elected him twice now. A lot of people have voted for this guy. That means America is this certainly is nothing close to the place I grew up in. I grew up in a place where the values were actually close to my own. And now I, I don't recognize them. And uh, this 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 kind of prominence of money is noxious to me, really, really noxious. And as much as I've been lucky in my success, the money enables me to do my work without without being uh, afraid that I can't afford to take care of it, which is really the, the biggest fear for me is not being able to do my work. But now the audience is, I'm not sure where the audience is for it. So you, it says, I am deeply dependent on humanity for the expression of my work. I, I'm facing this kind of double bind. Uh, so my hope is like uh, in, the, in the world of, of, of nature that in itself is not so corrupted. It's brutal. It's merciless. It's as beautiful as it's it's as bad as it is beautiful all of that is a, a collection of forces that are existing in balance and i love that balance and and humanity is out of balance with itself and with the world not only the scale but the toxicity that's coming out of people maybe because they have a venue to express themselves and it, it it's since i was born i i think uh you know, you still had the idea that your nearest neighbor, to, for them to know what's going on in your life, you would go over there and sit and talk with them. And that's how they would know you. They couldn't know you any other way. You know, you had that have that physical contact, you know. So if that's the note you want to leave it on, boys, you better pick it up here. Come on. Oh, man. You know, if there's anything toxic in my life, it's me. But what I do. You know, for me, it's so there's no option not to do it. You know, there, there never was, even when I was a kid. You know, that was the measure of me. So and it goes on. Nothing's changed that way. Nothing's changed. And, you know, I'll tell you, the big measure of hope in my life today are the loons out in the ocean right in front of my house. And they're amazing, amazing calls. They call to each other. And you have to get listen to these calls of the common loon. Seriously. devised by James Lingwood and Michael Morris, co-directors of Art Angel from 1991 to 2023. The theme is composed by PJ Harvey. Millie Roberts is the production manager and Matteo Pini is the editor. 
Nell Whitaker, Sorab Golsorki Ainsley, and Thomas Ruche are executive producers. Otomi Larcher is the graphic designer, and Stephen Lewin is the audio engineer. Here is Where We Meet is an original podcast by Tank and is available on all good podcast platforms. The series is dedicated to the memory of John Berger, from whose book of imaginary conversations its title is taken.